what Nicodemus is. And so for some of us, this will pertain more to you than others. In fact, this first message deals more with us who will be the epitome of the moral, upright, righteous man who externally meets all the right requirements of God's law without internally being changed by them. I want you to see this. We see that Nicodemus was a man of the Pharisees. He was a ruler of the Jews. And it says, this man came to Jesus at night and said to him. Now, look at the position that John uses this word. He starts off saying, now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And then he stops and says, this man. As if to say, yeah, the guy, the rule from the Pharisees and the set, yeah, this guy, can you believe this guy, right? this, this is him. As if to say, this is almost a shock, this is happening. And I don't blame him. You know, almost every time that you look in the scriptures, every time you see someone like the caliber of Nicodemus, who is religious and the ruler of the Jews, you usually don't see them sitting down with Jesus and actually talking to him. You usually see them like in Luke 15, 1 through 2, where you have before he says the parable of the tax collectors and all this, before he uses the parable of the law of sheep and all this stuff, he says there was a group of tax collectors and sinners sitting there listening to him, and then you have the Pharisees and Sadducees complaining against him. Almost every time in the scriptures when you see someone of the caliber of a Nicodemus coming, they're not coming to listen, they're coming to complain. And so here's one instance in the Bible where this type of a guy is actually listening to Jesus. And so John's saying, oh wait, this man, hey, he's a Pharisee, he's ruled, this man is listening to Jesus. I said it's almost a shock in a sense. And see, I think it's the same thing today. I hear testimonies quite a bit from the guy who used to smoke dope or the person who came off smoking heroin and the cocaine addict that got saved by Christ. And those stories never cease to amaze me how powerful those things are. But you know what I'm even more amazed at today? And you don't hear this happen very often. Is the guy that will get up on the stage and say, my name's so-and-so, and I've been to church for 50 years of my entire life. I taught Sunday school elder, elder, deacon, loved my family, worked hard, but I was a wretched sinner, and I just now got saved. Amen. You don't hear that very much. You don't hear that. And I get so sick of people saying this. Oh, I was never a hooker. Never shot up. Wasn't part of the bloods and the cribs in the area, Joe. So I really don't have a testimony. That angers me so bad. Amen. Because I think it's even more of a miracle, an amazing act of God. When you take someone who grew up in morality and all of his Christian needs, and actually he's converted from his religion, that's what Warren Mearsby said. Hmm. Warren Mearsby said, like most religious people today, Paul had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. It was not bad things that kept Paul away from Jesus, it was the good things. He had lots of reasons for religious self confidence. Get this. But he had to lose his religion to find salvation. Amen. That's the epitome of the moral, upstanding Christian man who's never been converted to Christ. Richard Sibbs, the great Puritan, said this. And I believe this. He said, There is more of a miracle working power in the conversion of sinful man than the creation of the world itself. He said, at the creation of the world, there was nothing, and God made it into something. That's pretty easy. But in the reworking, in the, in the creation, and in, in having to create a new creation inside of a man, he takes a wretched, sinful, God-hating man who loves his sin and indulges in his pride, redirects his life. He said, there's more of a working power of God in creating a new man and from an old one than the creation itself. I truly believe that to be true. Especially in someone like a Nicodemus. But as we continue on, look what he says. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. Which is interesting, and you really can't take much, too much into that. I mean, either Jesus was probably busy during the day, and he couldn't really have time to talk with Jesus, or perhaps Nicodemus was busy and didn't have the time to talk with Jesus. But it could also be that Nicodemus, in his pride, just didn't want anyone to really come and talk to him or see him actually go talk to this guy, because after all, he may lose his status, he may lose his position in the tabernacle or wherever he's at, so he comes at evening, he comes at night. So look what he says to Jesus. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have, that you have 
come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these things and do these signs that you do unless God is actually with him. It's interesting, his response, how he positions this. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Isn't it interesting how man tries to dictate for God who God is instead of God being actually who he is? You see, because it's often been said that this, this guy is thinking that Jesus, obviously you're doing these miracles to confirm the fact that you're a good teacher. But actually, if you look in the scriptures, and every time a miracle was done, it was usually done to confirm three things. First of all, to give credit to the messenger. Secondly, to give credit to the message itself. And thirdly, to point to the source. And so when Jesus comes to Canaan and Galilee and does this miracle, upon which Nicodemus probably was there to see, among other miracles, Nicodemus looks at it and says, Yeah, yeah, we know that God's doing this for you, Jesus. And, but it's only because you're just a teacher. You're not God himself, but you're just a teacher. As if to say, yeah, Jesus, I'll give you a little bit of credit, but just a little bit. Because if I actually believe that you are the Son of God, Jesus, I have to lose my status as being a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. I lose my status in this community. So I'll believe to you to the extent it doesn't take away the position of my life and the authority and the control of my life. I'll believe to you to that extent. And I submit to you that man is the same way today. We will believe in Jesus Christ enough to the point he doesn't cause a threat to our lives. 